Welcome to today's lesson on science in the real world. How is science relevant to us in everyday life? How is science important? What are the attitudes that we have to have with science? What are the important pieces that we need to think about when dealing with science? The second piece is the problems. What are some problems that scientists deal with on a daily basis that deal with us in everyday life? Technology. Technology has been a big help with science, advancements in science, and how has that been helpful? How do scientists share? Why do they share? And why is that important in science? We're going to take a look at the differences between theories and laws, and the difference between scientific theories and everyday theories. And finally, we're going to take a look at science and society. Again, how has society and science influenced each other with certain different situations. So to take a look at the scientific attitudes, there are four scientific attitudes that you have to take when looking at projects, when looking at information. The first one is curiosity. You need to be able to ask those questions. You need to have questions and you need to wonder about things in the world. If you don't have that wonder, then you're not going to have the questions which means you're not going to have experiments to be able to complete and to try to find answers to. So curiosity is a big piece and we need to remember to keep that curiosity. The second one is skepticism. You don't want to disbelieve everything that you hear, but you want to have some evidence behind it. You want to be able to retest. We've talked about the fact that a scientific experiment must have procedures to follow and those procedures must be able to be duplicated. If you complete a project and somebody cannot duplicate that experiment and you say that your hypothesis was supported, then it's hard for them to come through and say, I agree with you because they can't retest it. So there needs to be that retestability and that evidence base so that people can go through and they can look and they don't just believe everything they hear just because they hear it. The third piece of a scientific attitude is open-mindedness. You need to be open-minded. Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of scientists running tests that they, they think they know the answer to, and their answer is what they come up with, with a, for the answer to their hypothesis. You need to be able to accept different ideas. If your hypothesis is not accepted, you need to accept that piece of evidence. Open-mindedness is important in science. And the final piece of science that's really important is creativity. You need to be able to think outside of the box. So many of our big discoveries have, be have come because people were not thinking normally. They were thinking outside of the box. They were trying to come up with some ideas that were not just the normal. And because of that, they were able to come up with some major discoveries. So the four scientific attitudes are curiosity, skepticism, open-mindedness, and creativity. On to the problems in science. There are many problems that scientists use and they discuss on a daily basis that deal with real life situations. For instance, salt marsh degradation. Here in Florida, we have some major issues with salt mar marsh degradation. But we also want to try to increase the number of people that can live in certain areas. So there's a big issue between salt marsh degradation and the building of land for people to survive it. So scientists are some of those people that take and go in and say, okay, we can remove this much land, but we can't remove anything past that. Otherwise, we're going to destroy the land, we're going to destroy the area, we're going to destroy everything for the natural habitat, and then we're not going to have our natural habitat. A second piece is invasive species. The um, Burmese python in South Florida have, has become a major invasive species and understanding why those invasive species are having such being able to th thrive in an area 
and also degrading the number of natural species in that area. So scientists go in, especially biologists, go in and discover what's going on. They do research and they try to figure out a way to pull out that invasive species and let the natural habitat survive. Pollution is another big issue. Creating pollution, you've got smog on the west coast, major smog days, you've got issues with um, pollution and coming up with ways to reduce that pollution, coming up with ways to increase our ability to do what we need to do but not release so much pollution. So scientists go in, they run research, they run tests, and they try to find alternative sources of energy or alternative ways of doing something so that it doesn't release so much pollution into the air. And some of these issues of society actually lead into our technology piece. The technology in science is constantly changing. And because of this technology, we're able to discover new things within our natural world. We're able to come up with new evidence for things. So things that we thought were true a couple hundred years ago, the Earth was the center of the universe. We now have other evidence through more technology that no, the Earth is not the center of our universe. Everything does not revolve around the, um, the Earth, but the Sun is the center of our solar system. So the technology is constantly changing. Since the mid-1800s, we have now been able to see cells a lot closer. So we're able to see what things are, living things are made of. We're able to see those basic pieces of living things. So technology has helped us advance in science tremendously. Scientists share their information constantly for a couple of different reasons. One, for collaboration. If you can bounce ideas off of people, then you can come up with some better ideas as a group. One mind, not as good as two minds. We will work together in groups in science class this year. We will work in lab groups. We will bounce ideas off of each other. And then we will come up with our own ideas. Okay, so you'll bounce your own ideas off of each other and then you will come up with your own conclusions. The second reason scientists do a lot of sharing is what's called peer review. And peer review actually helps to keep scientists in check with their information, with their research, and with what they're trying to do. Peer review takes a look at a scientifically written paper. So a scientist runs an experiment and then they want to publish that experiment. In a peer review process, they would submit their paper, and then the scientists would take, the other scientists would take and look at it. They wouldn't know who wrote it, so they wouldn't know if they know the person or not. And then what they would do is they would review and see whether or not scientific processes were followed, and if they think that all of the ethical and other issues that science deals with were followed. If so, and they think everything is good, then the through the peer review process, the article gets accepted and then it can get published. So scientists share for collaboration reasons and for peer review. But through all of our sharing, we need to worry about making sure that we give credit where credit is due, no plagiarism, and making sure that you build off of your own ideas also. Now, in science, we have two words that are completely different than the real world words for those. One being a theory and one being a law. Now a theory is a possible explanation for a natural phenomena. Think about it this way. If you think about the theory of evolution, the theory of evolution is trying to find a way to explain why different animals have changed over time. Why is there, why does it appear that there are species that are similar now, but the other ones are extinct and they're not exactly the same? The theory of evolution, a theory is something that has to be tested. It's been tested multiple times. We've seen DNA change. 
So we know that DNA can change, can change. We know that mutations can happen. And so it's a way to explain how those organisms have changed over time. And it has been tested. Now a law is a little bit different. A law is something that actually describes how or why something happens. It is what happens on Earth or in the universe or in the natural world. For instance, the laws of motion. The laws of motion are set. If I take a ball and I were to roll it across the floor, it's going to have a reaction when it hits against the wall. It's going to be the exact same reaction whether I roll it today or I roll it tomorrow. It's going to be the exact same reaction. So the laws describe how or why actually something happens. It describes why that ball bounces off the wall on the other side of the room when I roll the ball across the room. So a theory tries to explain something in the natural world and a law actually describes how or why something does happen. Okay. Finally, we're going to talk about some of the major issues in science and society. One of them being ethical issues. There are some major ethical issues in science that require certain rules to follow. Because of that, it also sometimes limits the ability of scientists to do what they need to do. But those rules and laws are there to help protect our people, animals, and other things. So there's certain things that we cannot do. Ethically, you cannot test on people without them knowing, without certain, certain things. There is a story that the um, there is a story that the Nazis were testing on the people, testing medical things on the people in concentration camps. And because of that, whatever they discovered cannot actually be used. Whether or not that's true or not, we're not sure. But they didn't follow ethical rules, and because of that, that information, if it is true, cannot be used. The second piece is bias. Bias is when a scientist goes into some information, they go into an experiment, and they say, I know this is what's going to happen. Every now and then, <clears throat> when that happens, a scientist can say, I know that's what's going to happen, and all of a sudden, their experiment shows those results. Even if somebody else were to run it, and it would be different results. When you run, walk into an experiment with bias, you can have some unnatural changes to that experiment, maybe even without you knowing, subconsciously, but because you think something, that's what ends up happening because you make some alterations that you didn't put into your experiment. So bias is something we try to avoid in science and we need to avoid in science. We need to avoid it to keep that open-mindedness, back to the attitudes, to be able to understand what really happens in the natural world. And finally, this year we will probably talk about some major controversial topics. Science is filled with controversial topics. Now, just because you're in this class does not mean I'm trying to change your mind and make you believe something. These controversial topics are important to discuss because not only are they important to understand all the information, but when you understand both sides to a story, you are able to make a better informed decision about what you personally think. So we're going to cover some major issues this year that are covered in the standards that you will be tested on, so you are required to understand this information but I'm not asking you to necessarily believe it. So again, controversial topics are important in science, they are big in science, and we are going to cover some of them this year. So science and society work together. Science is something that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in real life, and the scientists help us understand 
why things happen or, or what does happen.